And welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker. We are studying through the book of John verse by verse, and we are now today starting John chapter 14. We finished up chapter 13 last time, 13 being the number of rebellion. And that is when we see the betrayal of Jesus by Judas, him going out to betray him. Well, today we're starting at chapter 14. And numbers are important. How important are numbers and how amazing are numbers? If you'll remember, John has 21 chapters. There are 21 chapters in the book of John. You say, yeah, so <laughs> what, what? So what? Who cares? Well, 21 is 7 plus 7 plus 7. And God always uses the number 7. So is that just coincidence? I, I don't think so. We've already seen that there's some numbers in this book that are important. So always remember to study the Bible and read the words, but also be careful to pay attention to the numbers as well. So when we finish this chapter today, we'll have gone through two-thirds of the book because one through seven is one-third, eight through 14 would be the second third, and then uh, 15 to the end. So we're almost two-thirds through the book, and a lot of people are excited because they know that when we finish the book of John, guess where we're going? We're going to the book of Revelation. So pray that we finish this book and do it in an orderly manner. Please pray that I don't miss anything. I want to give you as much as I can from this book and hopefully so far you've seen how much there is in this book. So we'll begin today in John chapter 14 and verse 1. John chapter 14 and verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. If we stop right there that might remind you of a certain radio personality who's also on the television in a certain news cable network as an anchor. And his name's Sean Hannity. And Sean Hannity quotes this verse a lot. Let not your heart be troubled. And then he stops. <laughs> I don't know why he doesn't quote the rest of the verse, but usually that's all of that verse that he quotes. But that is found in John chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. But there's some more there that is great news. I wish he wouldn't just stop there. I wish he'd read the whole thing. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. So Jesus here is speaking to his disciples. This is before he's died on the cross. And he's telling them, don't let your heart be troubled, believe in me. You believe in God the Father, will believe in me also. Because guess what? I am God. God manifested in the flesh. But I find it interesting, he says, you believe in God, believe also in me. Why do I find that interesting? Because James chapter 2. Flip over to James chapter 2 with me. In James chapter 2 and verse 19, look what it says. James chapter 2 and verse 19 James says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. So do you realize it's not enough to just believe in God, in the sense that there is a God? Oh, I believe there is a God. Okay, now are you saved? No. Now you've come to the same realization that demons know. Demons know there's one God, right? Are they saved? No. So it's not enough to just believe God exists or know that there's a God. You must trust in what God, in the form of the Son, Jesus Christ, did for you. You must trust in the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. That's what saves us, what he did on the cross for our sins. So, you believe in God, believe also in me. Now remember what God is. Remember, God is one God. So God is one God. Right? Right? But, he's in three. But he's in three. That is 1 John 5, 7. Maybe we should go there. Maybe we should read it. Many of your cults, many of your heretics, many of your Gnostics did not believe this. Many of those today who uh, have a false gospel and don't preach correctly, they downgraded and laugh at and mock what many call the doctrine of the Trinity, which is the belief that God exists in three, but those three are one. Well, I don't make light of it. I don't make fun of it. I try to explain it the way the Bible does. And many people try to say this verse shouldn't even be in the Bible. I just got an email the other day from a guy saying, well, Robert Breaker, you know, 1 John 5, 7 shouldn't be in the Bible. Dost thou speak Greek? Right? I had three years of Greek in college. I've read this passage, and in the Greek language, it does not make sense if you take out verse 7. 
Now, some versions, they take out just a couple of words. Well, even just the words that are missing, this does not work grammatically unless everything is here like it is in the King James Bible. And I've taught you before and I've taught you right that in the King James Bible, they put this in because this was quoted by the early church fathers, 100, 200, 300 years after Jesus. The so-called oldest text are 400 to 600 years after Jesus, and it's not there. It does not take a brain surgeon to connect the dots and logically come to the conclusion that, well, if the early church fathers 100, 200, 300 years quoted this, and four or 500 years later it's not there, then it must be there because it was in the originals because we have eyewitnesses to people that said they saw it in their text. So 1 John 5, 7 should be in the Bible. And it says... For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So we have the Father, we have the Word, and the Word, of course, is Jesus, who is the Son. We have the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, which is also referred to as the Holy Spirit. Is that three different gods? No, that is one. So that makes up the one God, but somehow that one God can manifest himself in three different places, three different ways, three different parts, three different manifestations, however you want to say it, that God is able to separate himself into three. But he looks at himself as, no, I'm still one. I'm not three. I'm one. But yet, when we look at it, we say, yeah, but there's three. Yeah, but those three are one, the Bible says. And it is not three different gods. It is one God and three, and those three are one. If you believe your Bible. Now, if you want to believe something else, you help yourself. A lot of folks lately have come out and attacked the doctrine of the Trinity, and that is so sad. It's called the Godhead in the Bible, and the word Godhead shows up three times. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. And this is one God and three persons. In Hebrews chapter 1... It says that Jesus Christ is the express image of the person of the Father. In uh, Corinthians, I forget where it was exactly, 2 Corinthians, I believe, and it says that um, I forgive you in the person of Christ. And in this chapter, we're going to see that the Holy Spirit is also called the Comforter. The Comforter. And it's personified by a capital C, the Comforter. So I have no problem whatsoever... Referring to the Godhead as the Trinity, even though that's a man-made word, I don't have a problem with it, if it's describing the biblical doctrine of one God in three and those three are one. And if we want to use the word Godhead, we can. But it's still one God in three persons if you believe your King James Bible. Now, here we go back to John chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now the Jews at that time believed that God was just one. And he is. God is one God. He says, Behold, O Israel, your God is one God. You can go back to, I believe it's Isaiah, and read these passages where it says God is one God. But there's verses, too, where it's interesting. They come to God and they say, Holy, holy, holy. Why would they say God, holy, holy, holy? Why would they say it three times? Isn't one holy enough? <laughs> so somehow, God is in three, but he's one. And we see clearly in this book of John how... God can divide himself into three distinct different manifestations. I like the word persons. I have no problem. God is a triune God. Look up the word triune in the 1828 dictionary. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many, now watch this, mansions. All right, we're going to get back to this here in a minute. But isn't that interesting? In my Father's house are many, I'm going to put it over here on this side as far as I can over here, mansions. Now, do you know new versions do not say mansions? If you have an NIV or one of those other perversions, it says, in my Father's house are many rooms. Uh-huh. Huh. Well, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but when I go to a hotel, I get a room, and it's very small. But if I went to a house, and it was a mansion, and it had a lot of rooms, I'd say, that's a mansion. And I'd be like, wow. So which one do you want? Do you want a room, or do you want a mansion? Well, the King James Bible says mansion. You know why? It comes from the Greek word uh, mona. The Greek word mona. And the Greek word mona can mean mansion. Mona. I guess it's got an accent there. So you take that word, 
and you look up that word in the concordance, and it says, here's what it says, abode, residence, mansion. Now, concordance is a dictionary for Greek words in the Bible text. So when you go to concordance, you usually choose one of those words to translate. But they chose room. Why didn't the new version say, in my father's house are many abodes? It didn't say that. In my father's house are many residences. It didn't say that. In my father's house are many mansions. It didn't, it didn't say that. New versions say rooms. So now you've downgraded heaven to a place that everybody wants to go to because it's full of mansions to a place where, well, if you go up there, you might get a room. Hopefully it's a good room. And who knows? Maybe it's a bad room. No, my God loves me enough that he's going to give me a mansion. And a mansion has many rooms. So another reason why you need a King James Bible, because new versions, they change that. And it's sad. Why, why do they change things? This has been the word for, what, 400 years? And they come along and say, well, we don't like the fact that you've got a mansion in heaven. We'd rather you just have a room. Uh, no, I, I think mansion is the right word, and I think God put his stamp of approval on the King James Bible, and when you get away from the King James Bible, you lose many wonderful, beautiful, great doctrines in the Bible. And one of those is, when I get to heaven, I'm going to have a mansion. And one of the hymns we sing is, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. Do you realize when you change Bibles, you're going to have to now change hymns? You ever sing in church, I've got a little tiny old room up in heaven. I mean, what a dumb hymn. Who would want to sing about a little room in heaven? I want to sing about my mansion in heaven. See how it waters down your joy and your happiness and your peace? In my Father's house are many mansions. Thank God for a mansion. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me a mansion and not just a room. Thank you, Jesus, for the King James Bible, which gives me a mansion and not just a room. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Okay? Verse 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. What we have here is a very important passage that I believe points to a pre-tribulation rapture, another one of those many doctrines that people are attacking nowadays, unfortunately. We look at this, and Jesus says he's preparing a mansion for them. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He's going to go up there and prepare a place. What's on the place for me? Somewhere up in heaven, there's a place for Robert Breaker. And on that place, he's prepared a mansion, not just a room. And it's going to say, residence of Robert Breaker. It's going to be full of rooms. It's not going to just be one little tiny room. Heaven is not a ghetto where everybody has their own little room in an apartment. Heaven is a place where we all have mansions. It wouldn't be heaven without a mansion, right? Now, he says that he's going to go away and prepare a place. And if he goes, he will prepare a place for you and will come again and receive you. When will Jesus come again to receive them? Well, let's look at this. This proves that you have to have, you have to have, a pre-trib rapture. Otherwise, this passage is a lie. Here's what we got. When Jesus came the first time, he was born. So we have here the birth of Jesus. Here is the birth of Jesus. Now, what we call this is the first advent and the second advent. You can also call that coming of Jesus Christ. So at the first coming of Jesus, when Jesus came the first time, do you realize he came twice? And when Jesus comes again the second time, at the second advent, do you realize it's twice? I pointed this out many times, and people still deny this in the Bible. The first time Jesus came was right here when he was born. Jesus came down from heaven and was born of a virgin, and he was here on earth. Not long after that, he died on the cross. He shed his blood for our sins, and thank God for that. And when Jesus shed his precious blood on the cross, the Bible says his body was buried. So he died, and he was buried. 
But then he rose again the third day, according to Scripture. Where did he go when he rose again? He went up to, guess where? Heaven. I feel like Bob Ross up here drawing clouds. Sorry about that. Sometimes when I want to relax, I'll sit and watch Bob Ross paint and watch that painting come to life in front of your eyes. Pretty cool. So Jesus rose again the third day and went up to heaven. But the book of Acts tells us that then he came back down. And he came back down and spent some time with his disciples before going back up again. So there is the second time. So there's two parts to the first advent or the first coming of Jesus Christ. And the first part is the birth. The second part is that after he resurrected and went to heaven and put his blood up on the mercy seat, he came back down for a little bit longer. I've got a video on YouTube about the seven appearances of Christ after his resurrection. And then he rose up again, Acts chapter 1. So there's two parts to the first coming of Jesus. There must be two parts to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And if you believe your Bible, there is. Okay? So I want you to see that, that how the Bible is like a mirror, and the things that happen in one part mirror things that are going to happen in another part. So here's the church age here. Here's the time of the church age. And here we are in the church age, and the first time he comes back, he comes back down from heaven to take the church up at the rapture. So that's the first of the two times that he comes. So the second advent has two parts. So the first advent, two parts. The birth, and then after the resurrection, he comes back down and then goes back up. The second advent has two parts. And they are number one, the rapture, and number two, Armageddon. So when Jesus comes back at the rapture, he takes the church out and up to heaven with him. So the church goes up to heaven with Jesus. Now, what did we just read right here? In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus died, was buried, went up to heaven, came down, spent a little bit longer with them, went up on Pentecost. What's he been doing for the last 2,000 years? Preparing a place for Christians. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Where is he? He's in heaven. So he's going to come get them and take them back up to heaven with him. That simple. So this must prove a pre-tribulation rapture. Now some people say, no, Mr. Breaker, there's no rapture in the Bible. Okay. No rapture. How's that work? I'll go away and prepare a place for you. All right? He's up in heaven. They say no rapture. Okay. So they say from heaven, he comes right back down in Armageddon, sets up his millennial kingdom, and he's reigning down here for a thousand years. Okay. Uh, where's the place he prepared for us? Is he preparing it here on earth? No. <laughs> he said in my father's house. Where's your father's house? Heaven. So you see how you have to have a rapture? Or this doesn't work. Because if there is no rapture, he's in heaven. He just comes down and reigns for a thousand. He's not taking anybody up there to a place prepared for them. That makes no sense whatsoever. Now, some will say, but didn't you say, Brother Breaker, that the rapture was revealed to Paul? Yes, that's one of the seven mysteries in the Bible. And it was indeed revealed to Paul about the mystery of the rapture. But also, it looks like God revealed it here to this fella as well. Now, remember what we've looked at. And I've told you, and we saw this last time, as they're at the Last Supper. A lot of the things in the book of John are not found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Why? He was one of the apostles. They were all together. They all would have heard the same things. Why aren't they all writing the exact same things? Well, in the case of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they are. But in John, there's a lot of extra detail. Why? Because there were many times when Jesus went, Hey, John, let me tell you this. And he told him in private. And this must have been something that he revealed that only John remembered. Or maybe he told this to the disciples, but they were like, Huh? Now, we're going to see here in a minute. There are many times when Jesus told the disciples something, and they were just like, I don't know what he's saying. I, I, do you understand? I, what? So maybe Jesus said this and they all heard it. They just didn't remember it because they didn't understand it. Or possibly when Jesus is speaking, there's times when he's speaking to John and saying certain things that only John gets. And so I believe that the book of John was written late. And I mean very late. Now some people try to say, no, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were all written at the same time period. 
I don't think so. I think John was written toward the end, and it came after Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I think what John did was read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and said, you know, there's some things they left out. And I think the book of John was written after Paul came on the scene and did his revelations. And I think John said, oh yeah, there's a couple things Jesus said, and we at the time didn't understand them. Now with the revelation to Paul, now I understand. So I'm going to go ahead and write this and, and write down some of those things that I remembered that Jesus said, because now I understand them. They line up with Paul. So there's no problem with the rapture as a revelation revealed to Paul. No problem that Jesus would have said something about it before. None. They just didn't understand what it was until later. So when Jesus is speaking here, this can be an application to the rapture. No problem with that. And it only seems to work with a pre-tribulational rapture because he says, I, I go to my father's house, I prepare a place for you. So he goes up there. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Okay, he comes again, takes up the church, and we're up there for how long? Well, eternity, if you will. We're outside of time because we're in heaven. But down here on earth, it's not an eternity, it's seven years. So I guess if you're looking at it from the viewpoint of the earth, we're up there for seven years, and then we come back with him. So for seven years, we're up there in that place that he prepared a mansion for us. So yes, this can and does apply to the church, but it also applies to the early disciples. They all went up to heaven. They're in heaven right now in that place he prepared for them in the mansion. Peter's in his mansion, and John's in his mansion, and, and these other ones. So do you see how that must make a pre-trib rapture? It doesn't make sense otherwise. Because if there's no rapture, Jesus goes up to heaven, you're all down here. And then he comes back, well, you're still down here. And now he's reigning for a thousand years. You didn't go up there to a place that he prepared for you. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. So only a pre-trib rapture makes sense. So let's start at the beginning. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Now Jesus says, now I'm going to a place, and you know where I'm going, and you know how to get there. When Jesus says that, Thomas goes, excuse me. <laughs> now we've already seen some problems with Thomas already. Thomas is sarcastic. Do you remember when when uh, Jesus said, yeah, well, okay, he died. And Thomas goes, well, let's go die with him. Remember, that's how Thomas is. Thomas is kind of a little bit sarcastic. Why would he be like that? Remember, Jesus is the king of Israel. He came, and he's preaching the kingdom gospel. They're expecting him to set up his millennial kingdom right then. And they're disappointed because here he comes in the triumphal entry, and they're wanting to call him king and Hosanna, and, and he just walks away after and they go, I thought he was going to be our king. So there's a little bit of disappointment there, it appears. Now then, verse 5, Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? So Thomas speaks up and goes, Lord, I don't think so. I don't, huh? You, you just said this. Jesus says in verse 4, And whither I, I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Jesus is saying, you ought to know where I'm going. You know why they ought to know that? Because he came down from heaven and he told them he came down. So they ought to know if he came from heaven, he's going back to heaven. And there's a lot of verses in the Bible on that that we've already looked at in John. Uh, John chapter 6 and verse 33. So did the disciples even listen to what Jesus said? Or was it so far over their head that they remembered some stuff but they couldn't remember all? And John remembered a lot of it that they forgot? Whatever the case, I thank God for the book of John because at least we have one account of it that nobody else mentions. So thank God for the book of John. Now John chapter 6 and verse 33. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Verse 38. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Verse 50. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. Verse 51. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And on and on and on. Verse 58. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Go to John chapter 10. Jesus is telling them, you know where I go. And they're like, no we don't. They should have known where he's from so that then they'd know where he's going back. He's telling them, I'm going back up to heaven. John chapter 10 and verse 1, Verily, verily, I say unto you, 
He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now verse 7. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Now, with that stated, remembering, we go back to John 14, 4. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Jesus is saying, I'm going to heaven, and you know that the way to heaven is through me because I'm the door of heaven. So if I'm the door, you have to come through me. So the way to heaven is through me. You should know that. And Thomas says, I, I don't know that. Huh? Were they even listening to what Jesus was saying? It makes you wonder. And again, many times Jesus is speaking about spiritual things, using examples of physical things, and a lot of times they were just going, burr, 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 I don't get it. Now, if we ever get to do verse by verse from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you'll see many of the parables of Jesus and how Jesus used parables. And he did it on purpose so that the Pharisees wouldn't understand. But he's talking and he's saying, but you, my disciples, should understand. And it didn't sound like they always understood. Many times they'd come to Jesus and say, explain this to us. Explain your parable unto us because we're, we're sitting over here scratching our heads trying to figure it out. And we just don't get it, Lord Jesus. Please explain that to us. Thomas saying to him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Well, they should know he's going to heaven, and that he is the way, because he is the door to heaven, and that they can go with him when he comes back, if they come through him, the door. Now verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, and this is a great verse, John 14, 6, I love to use this when I'm street preaching. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now the Father is in heaven. So you have God the Father in heaven. You have the Word, which was made flesh and dwelt among them. And you've got the Holy Spirit. And so the Word is Jesus, and the Word is saying, I'm the door to heaven, so I'm the only one that can go up. And if you want to go to heaven to the Father, you have to come through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, Verse 7. Now we're starting to get into some stuff here that's a little confusing. And I will do my best to try to explain it. But remember, the doctrine of the Trinity, or the Godhead, is called a mystery. It's called the mystery of godliness in the Bible. And it's very hard to understand God and how He can do what He does. And I'm going to show you some stuff in this chapter today that will probably leave you scratching your head. <laughs> I do not at all profess to understand completely how it all works. All I know is what the Bible says, and I preach what it says. God is one God in three, but those three are one. Now, let's look at this, because there's going to be some interesting stuff here. Look at verse 7. If ye had known me, you should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Jesus says, you've seen the Father. Now, how did they see the Father, if the Father's in heaven? Did they somehow get a glimpse into heaven and get to look up into heaven and see the Father? No, Jesus has said already, I and my Father are one, and he said, if you see me, you see the Father. How? How do you see the Father through the Son? Well, I don't know how that works, but I know one thing. I am my Father's son. My dad died in 2010. I sat in that hospital for a long time. Never left. And he passed away, and I hadn't showered, I hadn't eaten, I hadn't anything for a long, long time by that hospital bed. And after it was all over, I came home, and we have a mirror in our shower. And I've been staring at his face for so long that I got in the shower and turned it on and opened my eyes and looked in that mirror. And I didn't see my face. I saw my father's face in that mirror. And I looked and I saw my father and then it just, uh, it just changed and it was my face. <laughs> because I look so much like my father and I've been staring at him and I've been stressed and I've been going through and I, and I looked in the mirror and I saw him and then I saw me. And then it dawned on me, is that the Lord saying, hey, you're in charge now. He's gone. you got to take over. you gotta, you got to fill his shoes. And things like that. So that was just, that's something I'll never ever forget. Is looking in that mirror and not seeing me, seeing my father. And then 
You know what I am? I'm in the spitting image of my father. <laughs> People tell me, you're the spitting image of your father. You just look just like him. So, is that what it's saying? Is Jesus the father in the sense that when you see Jesus, you're looking at the father because he is from, is that, I mean, there's a lot of things going on here we're trying to figure out. How is he saying this? Because there are other verses in the Bible that say you cannot see the father and live. So I want to run all these verses and show you and tell you this is why people get in a mess when they come to the doctrine of the Godhead or the Trinity. And they don't go to all the verses and they get messed up. And so it's hard to explain this doctrine. So we don't want to get too deep into it to where we get confused, but we also don't want to deny it and not teach it. So we need to get the understanding that we have and teach what this doctrine is. So let's start here in, uh, well let's read verse 8 and 9 first. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Now, where's the Father? In heaven. So is he saying, Lord, show us what's up in heaven? Jesus said to him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Jesus says, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now, let's go over to Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3 and see if we can't figure this out. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. What is Jesus thinking? What is Jesus saying when he's saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? What, what is that? All right. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 through 3. And it says here, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, that would be Jesus Christ, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Why? Because Jesus Christ is God. He made the worlds. All things were made by him. Verse 3, speaking of Jesus Christ, look at this, verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So Jesus Christ is the express image of the person. So Jesus is in the body. Okay, We have the Bible telling us that we're made in the image of God. Well, Jesus is the body. We have a body, soul, and spirit. The Holy Spirit must be the spirit of God. The body of God must be Jesus, which means the soul must be the Father. Now, the Bible teaches we're body, soul, and spirit. All I can see of you is your body. But if I see your body, I'm seeing you. Because you are your soul. Do you understand that? You are what's inside of you, your soul. The soul is the spiritual part of you that lasts forever. That's going to heaven or hell and spend all of eternity still existing. So if I see your body, I'm seeing you. The Bible says the light of the body is the eye. Now, I'm not in the spirit world. The soul is. So I'm not in the spirit world looking at your soul. But if I were to die and go to heaven, and you were to die and go to heaven, what would happen? My soul would be in heaven and my body would be here on the earth. Your body would be in the grave and your soul would go to heaven. Would you recognize me in heaven? Yeah. You would look at me and you would say, hey, it's Robert Breaker, because somehow my soul looks exactly like my body. So you would recognize me because my soul in me has the same form of the body outward. So there would be some recognition there. So is Jesus saying when you see me, you're seeing the Father because I am the image of the Father? That might be part of it. I, I, I honestly don't know. But let's go to 1 John Chapter 4, verse 12, I just try to, to figure it out the best I can, knowing what the Bible teaches. God said he made us in his image. So, somehow, Jesus Christ is in the image of the Father in the sense that he looks like the Father, only he's in one world and the Father's in another. Heaven is the spirit realm, the spirit world. Earth is the physical world. Okay, two different worlds. Now, First John... Now, look, 1 John chapter 4, here's another thing to throw a monkey wrench in the whole works that makes you go, what? 1 John chapter 4 and verse 12. No man has seen God at any time. 
If we love one another, God dwells in us, and His love is perfected in us. No man has seen God at any time. They're back here in John 14 looking at Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. And yet he says, no man's ever seen him. Yeah, you did. You saw Jesus Christ. <laughs> and he's God. What are you talking about, John? Why would you... Is he saying no man has ever seen God the Father at any time? Is that what he's saying? Well, that kind of sounds what it sounds like. Let's go to Genesis chapter 33 and verse 20. Did you know that before Jesus Christ was born, he could still show up in a bodily form? We call this the pre-incarnate manifestation or, or, or body of Christ. In Genesis chapter 33 and verse 20, Jesus Christ shows up to Jacob back then. Now this is before he'd been born, but somehow he can appear, and the Bible calls it the angel of the Lord. So he can appear as the angel of the Lord. Genesis chapter 33 and verse 20, as the angel of the Lord, Jesus wrestles with, I believe it's Jacob. In Genesis 33, 20, we read, well, that's not the passage I want. Excuse me. It, uh, it's 32, 30. My bad. I'm lisdexic. <laughs> I said 33, 20. It's 32, 30. I'm dyslexic, I guess. Okay, Genesis 32, 30. And in Genesis 32, 30, we read, And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. He says, I saw God, and I'm still alive. What did he see? He must have seen the angel of the Lord, which is what Jesus Christ is also called. Jesus Christ, in the Old Testament, can appear as the angel of the Lord. Angel means appearance. So somehow Jesus was able to take a body in the Old Testament and appear as the angels could appear in the Old Testament. Now let's look at this verse, Judges chapter 13 and verse 22. Judges 13, 22. Here we have something quite interesting because the angel of the Lord appears here. And by the way, remember the angel of the Lord appeared unto Abraham with two angels? And he said, what are you doing? We're going over there to Sodom where Lot was. And it says here in Judges 13.22, Judges 13, Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 13.22, Here the angel of the Lord, which would be Jesus in his pre-incarnate state, appeared unto Manoah, the father of Samson. And Manoah said unto his wife, We shall surely die because we have seen God. They said, We are going to die because we saw God. They recognized the angel that appeared to them as God in the form of the angel of the Lord. God taking a body to appear to them. Now, why were they afraid of dying? Because they knew their Bible. Go to Exodus chapter 33. In Exodus chapter 33, we have God the Father appearing unto Moses. And look at what he does, and look what he says. Exodus 33, 19. This must be the Father. Exodus chapter 33, and verse 19. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. Now, who is speaking? God the Father is speaking to Moses. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see my face and live. God is speaking. He says, You can't see my face and live. Yet they're all looking at Jesus Christ while he's on the earth. And he is God, the Bible says, the Word. And yet they live when they see him. And he says, I and my Father are one. He said, if you've seen the Father, you've seen me. So how are they still alive? There must be more to all this. Look what he says. Thou cannot see my face, and there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by that I will put thee in a cleft of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. What an odd thing. Why can't you see God the Father's face and live? I don't know. I don't know. In Honduras one time, I was getting a haircut in Tegucigalpa, and they had a, um, in Comeagua, they had an Air Force base or an uh, American base, I don't know, Army base or something. And there were these two Army guys that came in to get a haircut, and I sit and listen to them 
um, talking. And they said they went over to this place, to where this mountain is, Mount Sinai, and they saw that actual spot where what he saw, he saw. And uh, it was like a little cave, you know, under a rock. And everything around there was scorched black. That's interesting. Because what does the Bible say in the Old Testament about God the Father? It says that he is a consuming fire. So maybe that's why you can't see the Father and live, because he's pure flame, pure fire, pure light. And if you stood before him without a glorified body, you'd burn up. Whatever he showed Moses, Moses lived. But he only got to see the back part, not the face. Now, you read your Bible, it says what? That he has hidden our sins in the only place where he can't see it, in his back. So all of our sins are hidden, and he turned his back to them, so they're behind his back. So I always wondered, what exactly did Moses see? Did he see his sin when he saw? And he's probably sitting there, why did I see my own sin when I'm looking? Because God hid our sins behind his back. I don't know. These are just things that I try to connect the dots with. But the Bible says our God is a consuming fire. Deuteronomy 4.24, Deuteronomy 9.3, and Hebrews 12.24. All right, now let's look at some more verses here. I want you to see some more verses. All right, are you with me? Jesus Christ is God. He is one with the Father. That is the one God in three parts. Jesus comes down in the body, and he says, I and my Father are one, but the Bible tells us that he's in the image of the Father. And the Bible tells you that if you see God, you'll die. And yet everybody saw Jesus, who is God. So they must have seen the body of God, not the soul of God. Because Jesus says that the Father's in heaven. And yet, he says, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because he's the express image of the Father, which is in heaven. So you can look upon the Son and not die, just as Jacob and Manoah and Abraham looked upon Jesus in a pre-incarnate state as the angel of the Lord and didn't die. Okay? Now, John chapter 6, verse 45. John 6, 45. It is written in the prophets that they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Jesus says then, no man has seen the Father. Later Jesus says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How can those statements not be conflicting? There's only one way, is if God has three parts... And those three parts, he can manifest as three separate persons. And when he appears here on the earth, he appears in the body form of God. And he says, you've seen me because I am the Father and the Father is me. I can't explain it. All I can do is tell you what the Bible says. Uh, let's go to another passage. John chapter 3. Here's one that's pretty hard to understand. John chapter 3, verse 11 through 13. John 3, 11. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak what we do know, and testify what we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. Verse 12, if I have told you earthly things, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Ah, there's a difference between something on earth and something in heaven. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. <laughs> oh, my head is exploding. Jesus is here on earth saying, I'm the Son of Man, and I'm here on earth, but I'm up in heaven. The Son of Man, which is in heaven. How can Jesus be here on earth and be in heaven at the same time? The only way is that he is God. And it's one God in three, and those three are one. So we're going to look at some more verses here, but I wanted to throw that out there. What a thing to say. How can he be on earth and in heaven at the same time? But he makes it very clear there's things on earth and things in heaven. So we have God the Son here on earth, while God the Father is still in heaven. But yet the Father is in the Son, and the Son is in the Father at the same time, just as the Holy Ghost is in the Son. How that works, I can't tell you. All I know is that it works, because God said it. And that's what the Bible teaches. And that in no way makes the Bible um, a lie or, or a contradiction or anything else. God is God, and He knows how He does that. All I'm trying to do is figure it out. Will we ever fully understand it until we get to heaven? I don't know. John chapter 5, but look at this. I'm a body, soul, and spirit. 
If I die, my body's left down here. My soul and spirit go to heaven. And look at this. I'm Robert Breaker up here in heaven. But I'm also Robert Breaker that's down here on earth. <laughs> because when people look at my uh, coffin and, and know my body's in there, they say that's where Robert Breaker is. And yet I'm up in heaven and I'm up here having a good time. No, I'm Robert Breaker up here in heaven. How can I be at two places at once? Because I'm three in one, but those three have divided actually into two. In my case, God can divide into three. And so here I am. So you can be in the spirit world and the physical world at the same time. So if that can happen for us, then it can happen to God. And God can be in heaven and send down the sun and be the same God and yet in two different places at once. Because he's God and he can do whatever he wants. Now look at John chapter 5 and verse 37. Maybe this will explain something. John 5, 37. And the Father himself which has sent me hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. Oh, so the Father has a shape that you can't see. Huh. That's interesting. So Jesus Christ is the express image of the shape of the Father. So he's there in the flesh. And if you see him, you get an idea of what the Father looks like. But yet you can't see the Father because he's in heaven. So th this thing is aggravating for some people. I don't understand the Trinity. Yeah, it's hard to gather that and understand it all. But if you understand we're body, soul, and spirit, it makes sense God would be body, soul, and spirit because he said he made us in his image. If you understand that we consist of three and yet we're one, then God can consist of three and yet he's one. It makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. Yet how he can divide himself and do what he does, that's what doesn't make sense. Now John chapter 14 and verse 9. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? So he says, If you have seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. How? I don't know. But I know that inside me is my soul, and outside of me is my body. And that when you look at me, you see my body. And I can say, You know, you see me right now, but you're looking at the real me, which is on the inside. And that's my soul. So I am tripart being. And part of me you can see because it's in the physical world. Part of me you can't because it's in the spiritual world. But if you were able to look into the spirit world and no longer see my body, only see my soul, you would recognize me because I would look like I do in the physical world. Okay? Does that make sense? So Jesus is saying if you've seen me, you've seen the Father because he's going to look like what I look like in that world. Only he's going to have a shape. So is he is he kind of like transparent in a way? And you see the shape, but the shape resembles the face of Jesus? I don't know, folks. That's what I'm waiting for. Can't wait to get to heaven and see how that all works. But we have Jesus in the spirit world and the physical world at the same time. We have the Father who's in the spirit realm, and we have the Holy Spirit who's in us, and he's in our spirit, and as such, he's in the physical world, but he's in the physical world inside the spiritual part of our being. <laughs> yeah. Are you confused yet? <laughs> All right, let's get back to John chapter 14. All I know how to do is just show you the verses. John chapter 14 and verse 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Well, here we get another monkey wrench. He says, the Father dwelleth in me. How can the Father dwell in the Son if the Father's in heaven and the Son is down here on earth? There's only one way, and that's if the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. And because the Father is God and the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is in the Son, then the Father is in the Son through the Holy Spirit. I see no contradiction in the Bible if you just kind of think it through. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Christ. Christ is God. So if the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit is also the Spirit of the Father. And so if the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Father, is in the Son, then the Father dwells in the Son. Hmm, that makes a, uh, a lot of sense. So they're still separated. 
So the Father is in heaven, the Son is on earth, and the Holy Spirit is inside the Son. So this is how Jesus can say these things and them not be hard to understand. They, they make sense. Now, I've got some verses here I wanted to show you. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, and verse 16, because there are some people out there that do not read their Bible, do not understand a thing, and they go through this thing like a bull in a china cabinet, and all they do is cause confusion by not explaining what the Bible says. And that's what I want to do, is I want to explain it. Matthew chapter 5, and verse 16. Let your light so shine before men, Jesus is speaking here on earth, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. So the Father is in heaven. Jesus says that clearly. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9. After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So the Father's in heaven. Right? John chapter 12. John chapter 12. So the question some people ask is, well, how can he be in heaven and then dwelling in the Son at the same time? The only way is through the Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God is in both of them. Because it's the Spirit of the Father and the Spirit of the Son. John chapter 12, verse 27. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have now both glorified it, and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said, an angel spake to them. Father, that's the Father, spoke a voice from heaven. <laughs> So there's some people out there that get so confused on this because they don't read their Bible. And the only way you can see this thing to where it's not a contradiction, to where it doesn't mess up any other doctrine, is that God is one God in three persons, but He's also one God in three parts. Now see, here's the ancient uh, debate over the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, one side, modalism. He's only one God in three parts. The other side, whateverism. Oh, He's one God in three persons. He's both, people. We are triune beings, and we are one in three. And those three are one. We have three parts. Now, we can't do what God does and divide into separate persons, but God can. And he's named those separate persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost. Now, with that stated, though, when I die, I can be viewed as two different people. How is that? When I die, my soul leaves my body and goes to heaven. I go up to heaven somebody goes, hey, who's that person? My body goes here to the coffin, and someone comes and looks into the actual coffin and says, who's that person? This guy's calling me a person. That guy's calling me a person. Does that make me two completely different Robert Breakers in the sense that I'm now two different human beings? I'm not two different human beings. I'm the same human being, but I'm viewed as two different persons. I view in the Bible God dividing himself up into three distinct different persons in the way that I view it. And one of those persons is the Father, one of those persons is the Son, one of those persons is the Holy Spirit. And that does not make three separate gods. That's one God in three, but those three are one. So it's all how you view the thing, and a lot of people view it incorrectly. They don't even look at all the verses. How sad, how sad. And all they want to do, get this, is stir up division and strife and debate and in arguments and go around and say you're a heretic you believe in the trinity you believe uh. i'm just explaining it if you don't believe it go mess with somebody else don't bother me please because all i want to do is teach you what the bible says and if you have a problem with what the bible says and you want to teach something different then don't attack me for you being wrong okay the bible is right and the bible teaches one god in three persons which are also three parts. And the three parts of God are His soul, body, and spirit, which is the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And yet, they're three separate persons as viewed by us because we view one as the Father, we view one as the Son, and we view one as the Holy Spirit. And it's our viewpoint we see three separate persons. Okay? Whew, man, glad we got through that. Now back to John chapter 14. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. So how can Jesus be, that's the question, in the Father, and the Father be in him at the same time? And the only answer is, we are told in other passages in the Bible, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Christ. So it must also be the Spirit of the Father. And so when the Holy Spirit comes into Jesus, 
then that's the Father's Spirit in Him. So the Father's in Him, and He's in the Father. Because they are one God in three, not three different gods. But boy, that's so simple when you look at it like that. All right, so let's keep going. Verse 12, John 14, 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Greater works than what? Raising someone from the dead? That was the last work, Lazarus. Well, we see the apostles. We see the apostles doing some great works. And we see the apostles raising people from the dead and doing some of these same healing miracles that Jesus did. But did you know that's called the signs of the apostles? Do you know that's called the apostles' doctrine? And do you know that's not around today? Because the Jews seek a sign and won't believe without a sign. And we'll look at that probably more next time. But verse 13, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now a lot of people look at that and say, that's for us today. So Lord, I ask you for this, 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 and this. Well, we have Paul today. And Paul says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. It doesn't say all your want. <laughs> God doesn't give us everything we want. But a lot of people run to this passage and say, that's for us today, and anything we want, God's going to give us. Well, I've been praying for 10 years. Lord, please give me $10 million tax-free so I can actually do something in this world. Get a good studio, get a home, get some things that I need, and get Bibles and print books. and do. Lord, please, tax-free, give that to me. Haven't got it yet. And you know, I ask that in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I pray for tax-free at least $10 million. Still haven't got it yet. What's the problem? Is this speaking to me as a Christian? Or is he speaking to the disciples still about what's going to happen for them in their early ministry, the Apostles' Doctrine? That's what it sounds like. Because we find out that after the Jews reject their Messiah and God gives these revelations to Paul, that now they're no longer apostles today. There's no gifts in which you can raise the dead today. And so what you find is, okay, well, um, we can ask God for things and then wait and see if he wants to give it to us or not. We do not believe in the prosperity gospel, which many preach today. So this is uh, for Jews. And remember, this is before Jesus died. So this is what you have to do. You have to rightly divide. Because I've come across people that claim to be Christians. They read this verse. And they said, well, I asked God for something. He didn't give it to me, so I don't believe in God anymore. So you're disbelieving, well, you're not rightly dividing. If you would rightly divide, you realize Jesus is saying this to the apostles before he dies of things for them. Now we're under Paul's ministry, so now we, we should go by Paul. Paul says, no, God didn't give you anything you want, anytime you want it. God supplies your need according to his riches and grace, but there's some times when God won't give you something. Because it's by his grace that he gives you something, not by whether you do this or that. We should thank God for grace, and for God's grace, sometimes by grace he gives us stuff, sometimes by grace he doesn't. See my video on YouTube entitled, Grace Versus Blessings, and you'll see what it was like under the Old Testament law. So verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Okay, well that almost sounds like a works gospel there, doesn't it? <laughs> Some people try to run to this verse and say, that's for us today. And if you don't keep the commandments, when well, you're not saved. Well, we'll get into that next time in chapter 15. And again, Paul says otherwise. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. That's us. So we've got to go by what Paul says. A lot of good stuff in the book of John that can be applied to today under Paul's ministry. But then there's some other stuff because it's still Old Testament. Jesus hasn't died yet that it's only for the Jews. So that's what right division is. You've got to understand that. Now verse 16, And I will pray the Father that he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. When do they get that comforter that abides with them forever? Well, this is taking place here in the earthly ministry of Jesus. It's not over here yet. So nobody's sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise yet. We don't see that yet. In fact, we don't see them getting the Holy Spirit until John chapter 20 and verse 22. John chapter 20 and verse 22. And in John 20, 22, we read, And when he has said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And then it continues there. So they received the Holy Ghost in John chapter 20. 
Here, Jesus says, I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit come, and when he does, he's going to do this. So this is still future, and it hasn't happened yet. So it happens after the cross. But he tells us that after the cross, when you do get the Holy Spirit, it abides in you forever. That's called eternal security. That once you get the Holy Spirit, it seals itself inside of you, Ephesians 1.13, and you can't lose it. So see how you can go to a passage like this and teach eternal security? Because Jesus back then, in a different dispensation, is saying, I'm going to do this over here. And now that we're over here, we can look back and say, well, that's for us then. When we get the Holy Spirit, we have it forever. You can't lose it. You cannot lose salvation. Once saved, always saved. And so he continues there and he says, uh, verse 17, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Now it's funny, it says he dwelleth with you. But then it says, and shall be in you. So he dwells with you and is in you. But yet, we just saw he's not in him yet until chapter 20. So, do you see how when he's writing this book, he's writing to Christians as well? Because he's writing way after the fact. And so, as a Christian, I read this, for he dwelleth in you. Amen. He's dwelling in me right now because I'm over here and I have the Holy Spirit and I'm saved. But he's also will dwell in them because it's written about back then. So, during the time that it's taking place, he's not dwelling in them yet. But over here he will. So people look at things like this, and they read the Bible just looking for contradictions. There's a contradiction in the Bible. He can't dwell in you and then later dwell in you too. I think that's silly. I think if you read it, you know what he's saying. We that are saved today, he dwells in us. But he shall dwell in those that get saved as well. And in the time that it was written, he will dwell in them when they receive him. Interesting. A lot more I could go into on that. I, I, I'm going to stop right there. But let me go ahead and read the rest of this and let's finish up because we're almost done here. I went a little long today and that's fine. But I wanted you to get a hold of the doctrine of the Godhead, the Trinity. I wanted you to get a hold of, of the Apostles' doctrine. I wanted you to get a hold of all this because this is important. If you read your Bible, you'll rightly divide it and understand you'll get a hold of a lot of truths. So, verse... Um, 18, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Wow, what a wonderful thing. I in you. That's the message of Paul. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And Paul says, guess what? That's one of the seven mysteries that God revealed to me. Christ in you. So isn't that wild that here he is mentioning it? Well, Jesus is the one mentioning it. And Jesus knows all things. So he says, there's going to be this over here. After Jesus dies and rises again, the early church goes out preaching. They don't preach that. Jesus mentioned it, but most of them forgot it except John. And John writes it down, and then God reveals it to Paul, and Paul goes, yeah, that's Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's my revelation. Guess what? It was revealed to John first. <laughs> Isn't that wild? Or it was revealed to the apostles in the sense that God said it, but they didn't seem to understand it or realize it. And it sounds like John writes this book later when he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, Christ in you, the hope of glory. I remember Jesus mentioning something like that one time, so he writes it down. So, continuing here. Verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and yet ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith to him, not Iscariot, remember there's another guy named Judas, that's one of the apostles, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. So, 
it's kind of hard to get through the book of John sometimes and understand everything that's taking place. But Jesus is speaking about coming and making an abode within. Abode within. Abiding, dwelling in you. This is what we call the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And Paul is given the revelation that when you're saved through faith in the blood of Christ, that's in this dispensation we're in now, see the early book of Acts is still going to Jews until they reject the Messiah, that now we have Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's indwelling you. We are sealed and we can't lose the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1.13. But it's alluded to here in John. So I say it like this. There's a lot of foreshadowing in the book of John. A lot of alluding to the way it's going to be later. And here Jesus is explaining later it's going to be like this. And it is today like that. So I hope you see that. That's one of the reasons why we can read John. And as we rightly divide John, we don't throw it out. Remember, hyper-dispensationalists, what do they do? They say, you can't read any other books but the books of Paul. None of the rest of it's written to you. And I look at the book of John, and I'm like, man, we got a lot of good stuff here written to us. But it's written in a different time, before Jesus dies, and we see Jesus prophesying of, now this is what it's going to be like here for us today. And so, oh, okay. So, yeah, we can see that for us. And when it lines up with Paul, we go, well, hey, that's even better. Verse 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So the Father sends the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus. So the Holy Ghost comes in the name of Jesus. And we're seeing Romans, I think it's 7 or 8. It's called the Spirit of Christ. Spirit of Christ. Who is Christ? Jesus. So, it can be the Spirit of the Father as well, and it dwelling in Jesus. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, what is that? That's the Father dwelling in Him. Solved. Easy. Understand. Now we know how the Father can be in the Son at the same time. I remember learning that in Bible school. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So what is the work of the Holy Spirit? Teaching and bringing things to your remembrance. Verse 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Well, that's how the chapter starts, let not your heart be troubled. Now it almost ends with let not your heart be troubled. What an amazing thing. So many contrasts like that in the book of John. Starts with something, ends with something. But then it says here, Ye have heard now, I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you loved me, you would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Well, that's verse 2 and 3. I go to prepare a place for you, come again. Here he says it again. I go and come again. Verse 29. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, you might believe. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. Amen. He's not inside of me, Jesus says. He's not demon-possessed. Who was? Judas. Judas had something in him. Satan entered into him. Last chapter. Now, don't have time to turn there, but he's talking about the prince of this world, little p. Who is that? Ephesians 2, 2, the prince of power of the air, Satan. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the god of this world, little g. So that's Satan. Now verse 31, But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do, arise, let us go hence. I just love that he says, arise. <laughs> because that's what I'm waiting for. We saw in a couple chapters before, Jesus is the resurrection. We saw in the chapter uh, before that, uh, or a little bit before, he told Lazarus, arise, or come forth. The rapture is arising and going up to heaven. Just The choice of words is amazing to remind us of the true doctrines. So next time we'll start in chapter 15. I hope it's been a blessing to you. Thank you for watching. Please understand what the Bible teaches. Don't get caught up in false cults that don't preach it right. A lot of people messed up on the doctrine of the Trinity. A lot of people messed up on the doctrine of the pre-trib rapture. When the Bible teaches first coming of Christ and second coming of Christ, each one has two parts. A lot of people use a different version of the Bible that takes out mansions. A lot of people think you can lose your salvation by losing the Holy Spirit. That's not what the Bible says. He dwells in us forever. 
So you got to learn that. Thanks for watching. See you next week. Bye-bye.